Okay, um, then let's start. And I would like to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. It's really my great pleasure that uh, Josh agreed to, to be keynote speaker at RSS. Um, let me just introduce him briefly. So he's professor at MIT for uh, computational cognitive science. He describes himself very interestingly as trying to reverse engineer intelligence in the human mind, in the human mind and brain, and use this uh, to engineer more human-like machines, which uh, is a really cool description. I think he's known, well known for many things. Um, I remember him uh, being in the pioneering uh, people when it was about uh, progressive programming, to be also leading figure when still Bayesian models were very popular and using MCMC models, like MCMC method for everything and modeling everything. So really also on the technical side, I, I thought that he was always you know, a pioneering figure in machine learning and cognitive science, which is uh, really great. He received many, many rewards, which I'm not gonna list uh, here. But the one thing that I actually wanted to uh, say a bit more personally is um, what I think is really great um, about Josh is the way he picks or what kind of problems he actually picks to work on. And I find that important for also for our field and generally for researchers to think about uh, what problems it's really worth on to work on and that are interesting also scientifically to work on. And I think Josh, of course, being influenced by all the questions from cognitive science, questions to really draw, uh, try to understand how humans you know, work, um, always comes up with super interesting problems to work on. And I, I quite like that a lot. And he's then also technically really strong to actually make progress on them. So I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to his talk. Um, your stage, Josh. Okay, thanks. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that wonderful introduction for, and for the great opportunity to be here and, and talk with the RSS group. Um, I don't think of myself as a robotics person. Um, maybe um, strangely, I feel like I have very strong opinions about robotics and how to do it, um, but that's based on my thinking about human cognition. And I know that my thinking is very incomplete, probably wrong in all sorts of ways, naive and simplistic. And so I'll, I'll, I'll put out my best attempts here to be stimulating and provocative, but I would love to hear from all perspectives. And, and really, I, I have a lot to learn here about the ways that I think I'm wrong. But I hope that I think that by, by doing what Mark said, by engaging in this dialogue between the fields of cognitive science and neuroscience, where we study the basic origins of intelligence in the mind and brain, and the engineering side, how do we build more human-like forms of intelligence in machines, I think all these fields have a lot to learn. And no more so, I think, than at the interchange between what I'm gonna be talking about here, intuitive physics, planning, and problem solving, and the mental resources that support that in humans, and robotics. Let me start with just taking a step back and the bigger picture, right? On this big quest that we're talking about, how far are we? How close are we to having any kind of machine intelligence that's human-like, especially we often talk about common sense, some kind of just a basic general purpose, flexible understanding of the world, the sort of thing that again, at this point, you know, while robotics has made great strides, we don't really have any robots or any other AI systems that have that kind of thing that even a young child has. So I think, you know, we might say, how close are we to the common sense of a, of a toddler even, let alone like an adult human being? And, you know, I and many in my field, and I think increasingly many people in AI, look to examples of phenomena like intuitive physics, um, like what you see when with this one and a half year old here, playing with blocks and cups and stacking up cups to make a taller stack. And we say, well, you know, Again, robots now, object manipulation has made great progress and even really great progress on, in robotic planning, some of which I'll talk about towards the end of the talk. But you know, to do what this kid is doing, having made a stack of three, then to make a plan where you can see he's making a stack of two to go on top of the stack of three and debugging the plan when problems come up, right? Like there has to be a tight fit, but not that tight fit. So he has to fix this, he'll succeed in that. He'll have another couple of bugs that he has to fix. But the ability to come up with this plan and then execute it, it's amazing. If we could even just capture this aspect of human common sense in a robotic setting, you know, that would be transformative for the field. Though I'm not gonna really talk about it here, but just to, just to point to the other half of the common sense picture that I and many others who are inspired by the studies of young children um, look to. We talk about not just our understanding of objects and their physics, but of other agents, usually people, could be animals, intuitive psychology, or sometimes called theory of mind or mind reading. So here's a famous experiment on another one and a half year old. 
the experimenter is Felix Wernikin, the guy who's um, standing with the books. And the subject of the experiment is the one and a half year old who sees the strange action and literally reads his mind, figures out what he's trying to do and how to help him. And you can see that he knows how to help him by how he opens the cabinet, he steps back, he looks up, he makes eye contact, he looks down at the hands. Again, you know, this isn't an action exactly like anything he's seen before. And to understand what's going on, he has to understand the physical constraints of the situation. So intuitive psychology sits on top of intuitive physics, but then he has to have priors on people's goals and plans. It's a really rich cognitive structure that has to be inside his head, the little kid's head, to understand what's inside the big guy's head so that they can coordinate. If we could have robots that could do that around the house, you know, it would be amazing. But I think we all have to admit we're very far from this. We're even far from the common sense of other animals, right? So for example, in, in intuitive physics, the famous tool using New Caledonian crows, like the one shown down there, who's, who's got a, uh, you know, like in a replay of Aesop's fables, um, there's some liquid in the tube, there's some food, and he's putting things into the tube. He just figures out that he could do that in order to raise the water level to get the food. Amazing feats of physical intelligence. Or this orangutan who's playing with big Legos and assembling them into a tower. There's some controversy on the internet for this video. Did he actually assemble the tower or did, or did somebody assemble the tower and then he just took it apart? Is, you know, is the video like a fake played backwards? And if you, if you see, I'm gonna play it backwards effectively here. It's still a remarkable feat of physical intelligence, even if he's just disassembling it methodically piece by piece. Or the way this mouse wrestles with a cracker to get it over the wall. Or one of the internet's latest sensations, uh, the Squirrel Ninja Obstacle Course. I think at last I checked, it's been seen by 32 million people, this one particular video by a guy named Mark Rover, but he's just a, a very popular YouTuber. I mean, well, not just, but that, you know, there are many people who've made these kind of squirrel obstacle courses in their backyards and scientists have studied them for some time. So I, I think you'd have a very fun 20 minutes watching these videos, just seeing the amazing feats of physical intelligence that these, all these different animals can do. So what's missing? Why can't, why aren't we at this point on the track to have machines that can do this? Well, I think, again, from a big picture AI point of view, one of the issues is that a lot, you know, a lot of the recent work in AI, the successes have been using a machine learning toolkit. Of course, that includes deep learning, but not only, right? So this re represents a certain view of how to engineer intelligence, which you could think about as broadly fitting parameters to data sets, right? That could include supervised learning, but also, you know, RL in some form, right? We have tools for pattern recognition, function approximation, policy optimization, and so on. And intelligence is about tuning the parameters of those, those functional models. But intelligence in the ways that we see it in, in human common sense, and that I think, especially in robotics, I think we all know this is really what we're looking for, is much more model-based. All the activities and capacities our minds have to model the world. So our ability to actually explain and understand what we see, not just recognize patterns and classify them. Our ability to imagine things that we could see, but haven't yet, and then to set those things as goals. Then to plan actions and solve problems that come up along the way, like you, like you saw in those kids, right? In order to make those goals achievable. And then learning as model building, right? Building new models as we learn more about the world. And that includes learning from both our successes as well as our failures. Okay? So if we want to understand human intelligence and engineering terms, we need to develop a, a toolkit, concepts and mathematics and engineering tools of all sorts to capture these abilities on the bottom as well as we've made progress on the top. I'm not saying the top isn't part of intelligence, it is, but we need this full picture. Okay. Um, maybe another way to also to point to the challenge, which I think is especially relevant when we're thinking in a robotic setting, right, is, the, is it, in some sense, the, the whole problem with what we call in machine learning a task, right? Um, there's a lot of interest in multitask learning going back decades and meta learning now, right? Learning to learn. But all of this assumes that there's a finite set of tasks, whereas for human learning, there isn't really, right? Um, there's, if you think of it, there's an infinite range of new tasks that we, in our finite life, find our way through some particular path through that infinite space. And we have to be able to generalize to this infinite range of new tasks with essentially no retraining or fine tuning, like zero shot generalization and a very strong form of generalization. I know that some great work in robotic learning is trying to work on zero shot generalization, right? So I know some people in the community take this as their challenge, but I just wanna show another couple of videos just to highlight the challenge and also the fact that sometimes the challenge isn't just 
generalizing to a new task that the world gives you, but really making up the task where the task didn't even exist until you yourself conceived of it at the very moment. So consider this baby here. This is a one-year-old baby, even younger than the cup stacker before. And what they've decided to do is not to stack up cups in the normal way, but to stack up cups on the back of a cat. It seems that their goal is to ask the question, like, how many cups can I fit on the back of a cat? Well, it looks like maybe two, three. Can I fit more? I'm just going to keep going. Four. Well, that didn't quite work. And now he sees, hmm, this is kind of hard. And he seems to shift his goal. Now it's, can I get all the cups to the other side of the cat, <laughs> including all the other cups, right? So he's going to go on with this. And, you know, again, it's amazing that in the course of this video, um, he came up with two new goals that, as far as I know, nobody's ever had, although I, I can believe some other kid had this goal at some point, right? But nobody showed it or gave it to him. Put the cups on the cat. How many can you get on there? Get as many as you can. Now push all the cups to the other side of the cat. So this is what real exploratory play is like. And this is both the way that we build our physical models of the world, probably, but even more so what, how we, that we show what models are already inside our heads from a very early age. Okay? This ability to creatively explore new action tasks is not unique to humans. So here's um, the famous crow snowboarders. Again, you can find these on the internet if you haven't already watched this. This is, there's, there's a number of crows who take an object and basically um, try out, invent the idea of snowboarding, um, including realizing that it's better to snowboard down the snow rather than a blank slope as he tries this here. It's like, nope, that's not so good. I'm gonna go back to where the snow is. <laughs> um, or um, a, a popular activity of otter stone juggling. These are just a couple of examples. Um, many, many otters apparently do this stone juggling and at least po in the popular science literature, scientists don't seem to be sure exactly why. But again, think about, if you want to call it like creative tool use, these are amazing feats of physical intelligence and we'd like to understand brain mechanisms that can lead to these. But still, humans are distinctive or exceptional in our ability to come up with new tasks for ourselves to solve, new basically physical problem solving tasks. Otters, as far as I know, um, have evolved to do that, right? Many, many otters do that. But, you know, take any one kid like this, uh, I think 20 month old on the playground who took what was supposed to be, you know, a merry-go-round and decided to make it a full body obstacle course, right? For older kids, you spin yourself around on this, but for a younger kid, it basically stays there and he just threads his body through it. That's what he decided to do. Or a little bit later, he decided to combine two of his favorite things, going down the slide and playing with the shopping cart. And he just decided one day, I'm going to take that shopping cart up to the slide and see if I can get it down the slide with me, right? And he succeeded at that. He took himself and the shopping cart with him down the slide. So again, just think like what's going on inside his head to conceive of that goal and then to, to judge that it's possibly achievable, worth trying out and then to actually execute it all the way from the multi-step plans down to the, down to the control of his body and, and manipulating these objects in a complex dynamical system. So I, 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 you know, at this point, I think I'm, I've established a big ambitious target that we as a field would like to be able to capture these kinds of abilities. And the approach coming from cognitive science is to start with what's sometimes called core knowledge by developmental psychologists like Elizabeth Spelke, or I like to call it the common sense core. But it's basically th this thing that we were illustrating here, these, this idea that uh, many researchers have identified, including infant researchers, but animal cognition researchers, neuroscientists, different research approaches in cognitive science have converged on the idea that from the very beginning, human thought, and to some extent, other, many other animals thought too, is not just about finding patterns and pixels, even high level continent features, but is structured around a basic conceptual understanding, a, a kind of a symbolic abstract understanding of objects and substances in some form. Right, people, there's a lot of debate over what is the actual representational content of this knowledge, but something like abstract concepts of objects that obey object permanence, that follow basic physical kinds of interactions and that have properties and relations like forces and masses, and analogous concepts on the intentional agent or psychology side. And we want to reverse engineer these systems of knowledge, and that includes understanding how they work in the brain how they come to be through learning and some combination of learning and development, and really how they bridge between perception and all the other parts of cognition, action and language. So I'm gonna focus on the parts of this 
big picture. This is a big research program that many of us work on, but I'm going to focus on the parts that I think are most relevant to the robotics community. So that's starting off thinking about how do we capture the intuitive physics side in engineering terms. And I'll show you something of how we study this in human behavior so you can see how we you know, put some quantitative predictive power and explanatory power behind these models. And then, we're, and then talk some about how we might deploy these models in an engineering sense. Um, and, um, and, and you know, they, they certainly dovetail and build on a lot of ideas, especially um, at the frontier of current planning approaches. Okay, so I'll get to some of those other topics with a brief digression maybe to talk about the brain, because I think when it turns out that the substrate of how intuitive physics is implemented in the brain, tells us something important about how it came to be and what it's used for that converges in a really interesting and elegant way with one thread of research in robotic planning. I won't say very much about learning because honestly, that's a really hard problem and we're still, you know, that's the last topic there. I'll point to partly what makes it so hard, but mostly that's gonna be open work. So in order to build these, these systems, as, as Mark referred to, before, there's certain technical approaches that in our group we've been using and, and helping to develop. Probabilistic programs or causal programming is certainly one of these. And the reason why we need this toolkit, I'm sure many people in, in the RSS community know it, but just to sort of give a, an intuitive version of what this toolkit is about and why we need it, think of probabilistic programming languages as frameworks and software for integrating a number of our best ideas of intelligence over different areas of the field. So not only the kind of neural network toolkit for pattern recognition and function approximation that's been so successful recently on some aspects of uh, intelligence and that is so effectively usable and, and keeps growing through languages like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on. But ideas that were really important ideas from earlier parts of the field that don't fit so neatly into that toolkit. So symbolic languages for abstract knowledge representation and real reasoning. Uh, Bayesian inference or probabilistic inference, especially in causal models where you would like to be able to make inferences about underlying causes that give rise to the effects that you observe in sparse, uncertain patterns of data, right? You know, over the, over the last few decades, these ideas have risen and fallen in popularity, but in, in, in fundamental importance, they haven't got, uh, nothing's changed, I think. They, in fact, we just see, if you look over the decades, I think you just see monotonically growing evidence, actually, that each of these ideas is important. And what we really need are tools to bring them together. So there's, over the last 10 years or so, there's been a flurry of languages for probabilistic modeling on symbolic representations, which now in the modern deep learning era, era build on top of languages like PyTorch and TensorFlow. So I've highlighted these languages like Pyro or TensorFlow Probability, uh, that's a Google project, um, Pyro started inside Uber AI Labs, but the main team has now moved to the Broad Institute in, here in Cambridge. Gen, which is a new language that's been developed in Vikash Mansinga's group at MIT, the probabilistic computing group, uh, led by Marco Cusimano Towner. That's, a, I think, a especially powerful language for robotics. Um, and Marco's just graduated from his PhD, and that's one of the areas that he's interested in going into. Um, if you want a very tutorial introduction to some ideas of probabilistic programming from a cognitive modeling point of view, I'd say check out the probmods.org webbook that Noah Goodman and colleagues have written. I'm one of the colleagues, but it's mostly Noah's efforts. And that's, a, that's just a really nice way to learn about some of these ideas, okay? We're gonna be using those in the background of some of the models I talk about here. The other thing that we're using is the idea of game engine programs. So again, everybody in robotics you know, knows about and probably many people use game engine simulators, either game engine style simulators, um, like game engine physics engines, but separate from like a Unity or Unreal setting, um, or actually even working in game engines, okay? Um, the, the small but important difference in how we're going to use these is summed up by the slogan, the game engine in your head, which is the idea that the simulator isn't just a training grounds for a robot that or an agent that's then going to be deployed in the real world with some kind of sim to real transfer. Rather, the game engine is in your head. Um, you might also have a game engine model to represent the actual world. But this is but the game engine in your head, this is what I was getting at with in part with the title, it's all in your head, right? I think cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have learned and become amazed by how much is actually in our head in terms of tools for very fast approximate simulations of the physical world, how it looks and our interactions with it. And those are the kinds of things that are captured in modern game engines. 
So we think, and this is just, you know, a kind of a crazy, but so, somewhat promising so far hypothesis um, that a game engine like Unity, let's just say, in some form, in some rough form, some very incomplete form, um, and surely also some wrong ways, but in some form, is like a working hypothesis for what evolution has built into our heads as a way to understand the world and to, to um, imagine our place in it and make plans. So think of this as a sketch of the representation in the agent's head for the world and their place in it. So that, for example, oh, these are just a bunch of uh, nice game physics engine simulations, but again, in this community, I'm sure everybody's familiar with all the things you can do with, you know, increasingly much faster than real time, uh, remarkably good simulations. Okay. Um, uh, but here the idea is like inside this kid's head when he conceives of a of a thought, like maybe I'm going to roll this ball and see if I can knock those things over. Then he's using something like a game style physics engine with various heuristic approximations, but real underlying parameters like mass and friction and forces, um, in some form, to predict what might happen when he put imparts a certain trajectory or with a certain force causes a certain trajectory on that ball. What will it hit? What will happen? What will fall over? Okay. So we've used these ideas going back almost 10 years in our group, starting with work that Peter Vitalia and Jess Hamrick did. Pete was a uh, postdoc research scientist. Jess was a undergrad and master student. And now they're both researchers at DeepMind where they continue to work on related ideas. Um, and the work that we started doing was to try to take scenes like these blocks world scenes and use tools from game physics engines, but also inverse graphics ideas. Another sort of probabilistic programming idea, right, is to take a program that captures a causal process, like the way graphics models the causal process of light reflecting off surfaces to make images and effectively run it backwards or to make guesses in the sense of guesses from the Bayesian posterior about the inputs to the program that would have produced most likely the output that you see named the image. So the, the toolkit of probabilistic programs operating on basically a game physics and graphics uh, pipeline provides an elegant way to think about the problems of intuitive physics, where you see an image like this one here, which is the output of some renderer, and you have to make a guess at the underlying world state, which I'm visualizing here with this black and white description. But the key is that this is a sample from the Bayesian posterior when we have a prior over objects and scene graphs. And then we have a likelihood based on basically simple kinds of noise model to fit the image under a standard simple game renderer. And then we're going to draw samples from that posterior on 3D scenes. So here's one, here's another one. So I'm just going to go back and forth and you can see there's a little bit of uncertainty in this Bayesian inverse graphics system. Here's another scene and again a little bit of uncertainty. Okay. And then the idea is that somehow we make an estimate of one or a few of these posterior samples and then that's going to be the basis for the physical inferences we make. Now, how do we make that estimate? How do we get a sample from a Bayesian posterior? Well, there's a range of different ways to do this. Here, I'm using a term that comes from the gen system of uh, Mansinga and uh, Marco Cusimano Towner, where, part, where the key idea in gen is programmable inference, so that you can have different kinds of inference programs. You could use what people traditionally have associated with probabilistic inference in graphical models, uh, structured graphical models or probabilistic programs, top-down sampling that based methods like MCMC um, in a, some kind of a generative graphics program. That is a classic way to do perception as inverse graphics. It's also notoriously slow. And it's one that most people in the vision community find just too slow to be practical. Now, I, I urge you to check out the uh, Kuzumano Towner et al.'s work on Gen, where they show that actually you can build some kinds of real-time Monte Carlo-based inverse graphics in Gen that, that really works remarkably well and pretty quickly. But it's still you know, generally not as fast as what we could get with, say, bottom-up neural object detectors. And you can think of training a neural network with samples that are drawn from the generative model from a probabilistic program as what's sometimes called training a recognition model or amortized inference or inference compilation. And basically using the tools of neural object detectors, uh, for example, we use sometimes the ones that Dieter Fox's group has built uh, for the YCB objects, right? Um, you could use those same tools um, or other custom built, um, what we have sometimes called neural renderers, to either make, make, make an approximate posterior guess or to seed in a kind of data-driven way, a hybrid approach where you start with a guess and then do a little bit of top-down sampling to refine it. 
But one way or another, you're getting an inference about the underlying 3D structure and then propagating that through the physics engine to see what happens. So a stack of blocks like this, well, what makes it look unstable to this model is that when you run the scene estimate forward through physics, well, many of the blocks fall. Here's what happens if you take a different posterior sample and run that through, and you see very different things happen. But at the level of intuitive physics, it's the same thing, namely most of the blocks fall. Okay. Um, just to visualize, this is based on the work that Zhang Jin Wu did a couple of years ago with, with me and Bill Freeman and Pushmi Kohli. Um, Zhang Jin is now just about to start up, um, uh, or has just started as an assistant professor at Stanford in computer science. And he put these things together in a computer vision sense. To, and it just shows you now we can re-visualize what that effectively posterior uncertainty looks like from one sample when you use a neural object detector and then a, I think it's bullet um, game physics engine to propagate uncertainty forward and then use Blender to visualize what we'd see. So I'm showing you one frame on e here in two videos of an unstable stack of blocks. And when I plus go, you see on the right, then cleaned up sort of the, the system's imagination of what is going to happen. You can play that one more time. You can see that what happens is not exactly the ground truth because we didn't quite get the physics right, the, the state or maybe all the forces aren't quite right, right? But at the level of intuitive physics, it's right enough. And if we were to, to run this again with slight you know, differences in the noise that would come from these object detectors, you'd get a slightly different sample. And that would capture some the, the kind of intuitively plausible posterior uncertainty. Here are a few other samples. And you know, again, I think it's hard to tell the difference between which of these is the right way for the scene to unfold. And that shows that we're capturing the physics at about the level of your intuition. But to do this more quantitatively, we do psychophysical studies like this. So this was back from Patali and Hamrick's work, where we show people, for example, 60 different um, stimuli. Each of these dots here is a different stimulus, a different tower. And we asked people to rate on a scale of one to seven, how stable or unstable is. How likely do you think the objects are to fall under the influence of gravity? And we have the average human judgment on the y-axis and the average um, model judgment, a few of these posterior samples, um, and just counting up the average number of blocks that fall on the x-axis, okay? And you can see there's a very good correlation. Okay. And this is typical of many studies that we've done. But I wanna note, and this is important, again, for thinking about you know, why the ideas of probabilistic robotics that were so important 10 or 20 years ago are still important and even more important when we combine them with these ideas of, you know, intuitive physics and game physics engine for, for state and dynamics. If we were to run the same model without any uncertainty, so using ground truth physics, you would get the following results. So again, y-axis is human judgments, x-axis is model. The y-axis is the same, it's the same data points, right? But the model is a much worse fit for humans. Okay. And that's driven by points like the red dot, which correspond to that one stimulus uh, there, that very apparently unstable tower. But what you can actually see is that in the ground truth physics, it's not actually unstable. It doesn't move at all. The blocks are balanced just so, so as not to move. But people don't see it that way. It looks like it should be falling over, which is why for the probabilistic model, when you take any sort of you know, typical posterior guess, it does turn out to be very unstable. That's why on the left side, the model is far out towards very likely to fall. But on the ground truth physics, it's all the way on the zero side, right? And there's a number of other points. This is just the most extreme of what you could call a physical stability illusion. So it just shows one of the ways that probability and approximation are woven into our intuitive physics engine. It's not just ground truth Newtonian mechanics, right? We're making certain approximations about what forces are in play and we have you know, in inherent uncertainty in the state. The same kind of model can make many other judgments, and I won't go into all the details of these here um, in Bloch's world scene. But the key is that, and I think what's important, is that these represent different tasks, like a judgment of which way will the blocks fall, or what happens if some of the blocks are colored differently, are uh, made out of much heavier material, or you can make mass inferences, right? Um, this doesn't seem to be falling. Why, why is that? Is something heavier or lighter than the other? But the key is that it's the same model that does all of these. It's not trained to do one of these tasks. It's just queried by the probabilistic program. Okay, So you run the simulation, and then you evaluate some predicate on the state after a couple of time steps. I'll illustrate this with one more example, just to show the power of this kind of model-based approach for strong generalization to new tasks. So consider this task, which, unless you've seen this talk before, and I, I do talk about these things a lot in, in the broader AI community, so you may have seen this before. But if you haven't seen this before, or think about the first time you might have seen this, 
this, you know, the, the first time you encounter this, this is not a task you have done concretely in your daily life. It's a sort of weird one that I made up, but that's to make the point that I can specify a task, not with a data set or a loss function, but by giving you a sentence in English, a question, and your brain can parse that into the kind of representation which can evaluate the value of some underlying predicate that the question is asking you about on one of these simulation-based representations. So imagine if the table is bumped hard enough to knock some of the blocks onto the floor. Is it more likely to be red blocks or yellow blocks? Well, again, here, I think we'd all say red. Here, probably you'd say yellow, red, yellow, um, yellow, yellow, red, maybe yellow. Okay. So I just gave 10 samples and I gave you my sense looking at them and I, you can all follow along and, and try this out, right? If I were doing this live, I would have people um, say it out because you know when you when you say it out loud in a large group you can see that sometimes everybody responds exactly the same way really quickly other times there's some delay and a little bit of blur or uncertainty that's again the probability okay and maybe several samples are needed in some time in some cases so we model this as such here's one of these scenes reconstructed inside a simple game physics engine and then we can model a bump a small bump or a big bump right and what you can see again is that in this case, it doesn't really matter whether you had a small bump or a big bump. At the level of intuitive physics, the same thing happens, although the micro details are the same, namely all the yellow blocks go over and fewer none of the red blocks. It also shouldn't matter if you run the simulation for only a few time steps, because you can already tell what's happened in terms of what's going, what's off the table. And it doesn't have to be a very high precision simulation either. Okay. So if you're worried that like somehow what I'm suggesting or what this would require is like very accurate simulations of highly nonlinear systems that we're not talking about that. We, obviously that's not going to be practical for brains or machines. Okay. Um, but intuitive physics can be practical on running a small number of, of approximate uh, short time scale simulations, at least you know, for many kinds of settings. And as we'll see on the planning side, that can correspond often to the setting of let's say model predictor control. So, but here, just in inference, this model now is able to fit human data basically as well for this totally novel, strange task as the same model fit the much more familiar task, which you might have had a lot of, you know, call it pattern recognition experience for judging stability. But if, if the model is able to fit both well and people are able to do both judgments just as well, you know, again, it suggests that they're not performing this because of some task that they've learned or a sequence of tasks or task transfer, but rather some underlying very general model that they can deploy. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details on this, but again, in, um, it's very interesting to study some of the ways that both the approximate nature of game physics engines and the probabilistic way of using them that we've treated here lead to really interesting kinds of illusions. I already talked about some stability illusions, but there's also ones that come up in how people understand phenomena of angular momentum, torques, and so on, that, that, seem, to, that seem to come up basically when you have a non-uniform or non-convex distribution of mass. And it seems like when we're putting things into our mental game engine, we often make the approximation of a uniform distribution of mass over some convex approximation to what we're actually seeing. And that, that's, that's yet another way that, uh, that inferences on the or approximations on the inference side and on the modeling side lead to systematic illusions. And those may just be ones that our system has to deal with somehow. We can use the same kinds of models for inferring parameters, like for example, inferring mass from dynamic scenes like these ramp scenarios here where objects have different sizes and shapes and different color material texture. You know, it might look like it's made of wood or brick or iron, but what really tells you about the mass is how the two objects move when they collide. And sometimes something that might look heavy is actually turns out to be light in terms of transfer of momentum. Or scenes like these ones on the right, where the blocks are identical in each row, but depending on how they splash or how they move when we turn on the hairdryer or how they deform that cloth, we get a, an inference about how heavy they are. And we can model these. These are um, things that uh, Judge and Wu did together with Ilka Yildirim in our group and Kevin Smith. Kevin is still in our group as a advanced research scientist. I'll show some more of his work later. Ilker is now uh, recently started as an assistant professor at Yale. And they showed how to do model-based inferences of, of both um, probabilistic program sorts, but also using, using various kinds of deep neural networks on the perception side to enable things. But to take advantage of the fact that fundamentally we can see scenes like this and we can model them in our physics engine and by, and, and, our, and by trying out simulations with different parameter settings, we can compare what we imagine to what we see to make an inference of the mass. But 
you can make things a lot faster by, for example, using a standard vision convnet to make a first guess at mass and friction, which, which makes sense because static visual properties that you can get from an image of the object are often informative, but then those are tested in the top-down way via your simulation engine, your physics engine, and that drives um, uh, a sort of an MCMC final inference or a particle filter inference, so a sequential Monte Carlo. Or you can implement the whole kind of thing in a neural inference network. And they've shown that on some cytophysical experiments, all of these models, but actually the, the neural recognition and particle filter ones, which are actually the, the sort of the most efficient online approximations, do the best job of capturing people's judgments about the mass of different kinds of materials um, from a range of these dynamic interactions. We can apply the approach also to liquids, right? So, you know, in the early days, well, physical simulation and game physics focused on very simple rigid bodies. But at this point, we can do things like this quite easily. So here's a fluid simulation of water um, splashing down from, a, from the top of the scene. Um, and there's a cup, some of it lands in the cup. Here's a honey-like material. And we've done experiments. These were led by Chris Bates, who recently finished his PhD at Rochester and is about to start a postdoc at Harvard. Um, and the idea here was we asked people to make judgments. They saw the first frame of one of these scenes and were asked, how much water will wind up in the cup? Okay, and, and they, as, a, as a function of the, the geometry of objects, we could vary the scenes, we could vary where the cup was, we could vary the, so the fluid properties. We could also ask other judgments like uh, where there's a divider left to right, will more, you know, how much will fall on the left versus the right side. And I, I won't go into the details, but the high level story is that this is a hard task as it, it should be, but people are still pretty good at it in the sense that they're reliably above chance in almost all cases. Conditions. And most interestingly, we can model their judgments quantitatively using the same kinds of physics simulators that are used to actually generate these kinds of animations in games and movies, so particle-based simulators. But the key interesting thing here is that while a, particle, a standard particle simulation to make a really nice movie might use 50,000, 100,000 particles, maybe even more, you know, if we want to render this as a nice movie, um, you know, like as water, it's going to have to look like that. Um, our best fits when we use the same kind of model to model human intuitions, we, we can get away with only 50 particles, not 50,000, but 50. And that again makes sense, right? I think if we have something like a particle based simulator in our head, 50 or 100 particles for a small scene like this is probably more plausible than 100,000 or a million. And that's not enough to make a, a perfectly accurate simulation or a very accurate one but it might be enough to capture what, what we need to understand about fluids so that we can interact with them. Okay. Um, so just briefly turning to the brain for a couple of minutes, and then I will spend the last part of the time on planning and problem solving. Um, in a series of experiments that were done in Nancy Kamrischer's lab, Kamrischer is one of my colleagues uh, at MIT, starting with Jason Fisher, who's now a professor at Johns Hopkins, but also with um, a number of others I'll talk about, uh, Sarah Schwetman and Pramod, um, we've identified a candidate network of brain areas in the human brain that seems to underlie these intuitive physics judgments by basically having people, we started off by having people make the same kinds of judgments that you've seen with tight controls that are matched in difficulty and very and often exactly the same stimulus. And then we see which parts of the brain are selectively active when you make the physics judgment. And the interesting part is that the regions that we've identified, which are shown here, um, are a network of regions in the um, pre or the frontal premotor cortex, kind of here, and a little bit behind that, the parietal cortex, which have previously been studied. It's not like we were the first people to find um, these two things working together, but they've previously been, stu been studied in the context of action planning and tool use. Also, if you've heard of mirror neurons, how we might understand other people's actions and um, learn through demonstration or imitation same regions in, in some form seem to be implicated, okay? So this is the puzzle I wanna think about. And I think this brings us back in an interesting way to the robotics connection. Um, in, this is recent work by Pramod working with Kamisher and me and others. Um, it turns out that these same areas also have a generalizable notion of stability that is basically represents in somehow the same decodable terms from the same neurons, an unstable, just pure physical scene or a person in a precarious, unstable configuration. And we can decode mass from these parts of the brain. So those same stimuli I showed you before, um, they, 
that they, though, though they're all different in terms of the kinds of motion, they all give you a sense that one thing is heavier or lighter. And this part of the brain represents that mass um, inference in a consistent, uh, generalizable, invariant way. So we have at least some evidence that it is doing the kinds of things that we think the intuitive physics engine should do. And also the models I talked about from Ilker Hildebrim can be at least in a speculative rough form that we still have to spell out, mapped onto not only those parts of the brain, but the earlier parts of the visual system that, that lead input to them. So the ways we were using convnets before to estimate mass, the static appearance properties of objects, those might correspond to some of the so-called ventral stream inputs that then um, interact with and see these more dorsal stream uh, physics computations. Okay. So th again, that's just a very quick dive into neuroscience, but I, I hope it shows the link between intuitive physics that we could just study in a sort of passive observation way and things like, and, and that, and that you know, um, are relevant to how we predict what's gonna happen next, where it's time to act, but also how that's deeply connected to actually planning and executing our actions as well as using tools. So, you know, I, I think that, that this will be very familiar, of course, to this community because I have been very inspired in work like, for example, done by Emo Todorov and colleagues, both using Mujoko, but before Mujoko, and Russ Tedrake and colleagues uh, using Drake. Both of these are phys physically based, model based frameworks for doing trajectory optimization, uh, whether in a model predictive control setting or some other kind of setting, and, and showing remarkable. Um, uh, kinds of planning abilities for complex full body motion. Okay. And so I think it's not a crazy idea to think that maybe just as, as they've shown how powerful a physics engine can be for figuring out how to move your body around space, that might be why we have a physics engine in the first place in our brain. But then once we have that, it could be adapted or accepted to serve many other much more maybe creative goals. Now, of course, there are other ways to learn how to move your body around space. So here's an example, a paper from Sergey Levine and others in the, and, and Erwin Kumans, um, cr uh, creator of Bullet um, from the Google Robotics team, which, which is an RSS paper. And uh, it's one of the best paper nominees. And I, I don't know who won the best paper if that's even been decided yet, but it's definitely a good paper. And it's a very interesting paper showing how you can actually do imitation learning from motion capture on real, let's say, dogs or four-legged animals, and then use that to train analogous locomotion policies in a robot and actually get the sim to real to work too. But the policy learning in the simulator, I, I, if I remember from the paper, it was they were running something like 200 million uh, steps of policy optimization. And, you know, um, animals don't seem to actually learn that way. <laughs> so, I mean, again, as we're probably familiar with from watching nature videos, here you have a baby Impala and here you have a baby Thompson's gazelle over on the right. And you're seeing each in their first few minutes of life, right? Where they didn't have to learn from um, extensive experience in a simulator, um, unless it was a simulator inside their own head, <laughs> right? Um, and they have to be able to learn to walk, to execute um, basically walking policies, which are somehow already available to them when they're born, but they still, they still have to learn the coordination. They have to, you know, their muscles are a little bit weak and unstable. So there's hard learning problems, but it's a matter of minutes for them to be able to actually get up, get up to walk. Otherwise they're gonna be left for, for um, no good <laughs> by their parent. Okay, so I think a, trajectory optimization or model predictive control with a strong physics model of the body is, you know, a, a, is our most plausible way to think about what's going on here, together with the kind of um, sim to real adaptation that's needed to actually get this to work, but in a, but in a real time online corrective sort of sense. Now, again, there's all sorts of really interesting developments that blur these lines, which I'm sure this community is familiar with. So for example, the work of Yan Ming Hu, who's a PhD student, at MIT, really remarkable student who's um, led a number of efforts, most recently the Tai Chi Differentiable Programming Language, which he's used to build a number of different kind of physical simulators for walking type motion, right? And the key is that these are fully differentiable. So all the things that one likes about neural networks can be applied here, but you don't have to learn, you can just do optimization, right? So the idea that you would build a strong model that then could just be optimized in the trajectory optimization sense to control uh, flexible body motion, including adaptive bodies, when you might 
have, you know, your body might come out differently than you thought. Um, you know, I, when I look at the, uh, the study of human locomotion, it's amazing um, how adaptive even young walkers are. And I look to the trajectory optimization kinds of tools that the robotics community has been developing as a sign of how this might actually be implemented in the brain and maybe some motivation to further develop and pursue those approaches. So Karen Adolf at New York University, NYU, is one of the world's experts in studying kids, excuse me, kids' motor learning and planning. Here are a few videos from studies in her lab, for example, showing a baby who has never crawled down a ramp before, but you change the slope of the ramp, and just when it reaches a certain critical angle, the baby just figures out for themselves that they need to turn around, right? Because it wouldn't be safe to go down forward. They have to turn around and they'll, they'll be better the other way. Or you give them these little cliffs and, you know, again, they somehow just find their way over these surfaces. They're all being spotted here so they can't hurt themselves. Um, and, you know, it's, you, one could watch this for a long time. These are quite fun videos to watch. Um, I'll just say check out Karen Adolph's work um, if you're interested to learn more about this. Um, if you, um, you know, uh, these are the same kind of things I was showing earlier, or, you know, to remind us adults that we can do this sort of thing too, whether it's the classic game of Twister where, you know, think about the first time you played this game, or maybe you've never played it, but you've seen people playing it, or you've just seen the box and you can imagine what it would be like, right? When I say it's all in your head, what I mean is you have the ability, even though you've never done this crazy task of put your left hand on red and your right foot on yellow, and then you have to wrap yourself around and underneath all the other people, but yet you can do that. And you might mess up a little bit and that's fun, right? But the ability to flexibly solve that problem for the first time, well, you know, again, it's a remarkable ability. And I think some kind of, you know, physics-based full body optimization is our, is our best route to it. Or just one other example, think about just to, uh, you know, inspire some, some discussion perhaps, new ways to walk. So you know how to walk on tiptoes and you've done it a lot, but imagine some other funny ways to walk. Like, can you walk on tip heels, right? So like on your heels, but only touching them, like tiptoe. You know, I think, yeah, you can imagine doing that. Um, what about on tip knees? Harder, right? It's, you, you probably can imagine doing it, but you probably think it's harder than tip heels. And I think you'd probably be right. You can try it out later. What about walking on one tiptoe and one tip heel? So like your left tiptoe and your right tip heel. Can you do that? Yeah, I think I could do that. Um, what about one tip heel and one tip knee? Mm, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> um, tip elbows, not a chance. <laughs> um, but tip elbows and tip knees, so not like hands and knees, but only touching my elbows and my knees. Yeah, I think I could do that, I'm not sure. But I bet you can actually, okay. So these are just examples of ways that we can, not perfectly, but imagine new ways to use our bodies. And I think it's using that same physics model, the same way that people like Emo Todorov or Russ Tedrake might use these things, okay? Um, I'll just point to one last paper along these lines, which is one of my favorite papers of all time by Igor Mordach. He did it as part of his PhD work with Emo and Zoran Popovich. And again, I'm sure many, if not everyone in the community knows this work, um, where they introduced their version of contact invariant optimization. It's some of these same ideas are embodied in Mujoko. Um, but this was prior to Mujoko. And they showed that doing trajectory optimization with this approach was a way to synthesize in a simulator um, an amazing range of actions, whether it's getting up from being on the ground um, in all these ways or climbing up on top of a platform. Think about how much this is just like those, those studies from Karen Adolph's lab, right? Um, the ones with the babies going up and over and down the cliffs or you know, even something like this. The babies will try to go up and down those things. They might need help. Um, or how we pick up objects or even like how we might hand an object to somebody else, right? If you can do joint optimization, okay? Now, you know, admittedly, or here standing on someone's shoulders, this is a graphics paper, a SIGGRAPH paper. And everybody is in, in robotics community who says, but that's just a simulator that'll never work in the real world. I, we all, of course we agree, but I wanna make two points here, right? One is that it's still in your head. You can imagine these kinds of things when you dream at night, you do imagine these kinds of things. And being able to imagine them might be the first step to being able to actually make these plans in your body in a flexible zero shot generalization kind of way, okay? And also, as, as again, this community has shown, there's been rapid progress in closing the very substantial sim to real gap, right? Just in the less than 10 years since this paper came out, um, you see all sorts of things, whether it's from uh, Igor and Emo or from Sergey and, and the Google group that I just cited, 
with, and, and a number of other groups that actually, you know, getting model-based approaches or that have things that have been worked out in some form, whether it's through RL methods or optimization, trajectory optimization in a simulator, then getting that to actually work in the real world, um, we might be able to do that very fast and sample efficiently. So I think it's, I think this kind of idea as the heart of motor planning is not crazy. Um, two other just examples of planning problems that we think about and that some of the tools that people in our group have been working on might be relevant. Think about making new things like out of clay. Okay. Again, humans have been doing this for a very long time. Um, this is a picture from somebody's website, creating primitive pottery in my backyard. So you have a ball of wet clay. Can you make a bowl? I don't mean like a good bowl <laughs> or one that anybody would buy or really want to use, but can you imagine how to shape that into a container that could hold a little bit of liquid or a few berries or nuts? Maybe, you know, something like that, right? Well, you can, even if you've never actually been shown how to do it, you can do that, right? You can pound and shape, okay? How do you do that? Or think about all the other things you could make, a plate or a vase or a box or something like that. Okay. So one way to do it is to use a, a particle-based physics model that's set up in a differentiable way to support trajectory optimization. So here I'm pointing to some great work that's come out of Dan Yemens' group at Stanford. I, I played a very small collaborative role in this project along with a number of others. But Damian Rauka was the first author um, along with several other students in Yemens' group. And they introduced a kind of graph neural network, a hierarchical relational graph neural network that involved what sort of standard pair, now standard pairwise graph convolution, but also a hierarchical kind of convolution. And they showed how this system could be trained to model many different kinds of physics, including soft bodies and liquids. Or some extensions of this, which were done at MIT by Yunju Li and colleagues working with Russ Tedrake and Antonio Taralba and Jajun Wu and me and others. Um, basically the same kind of thing, but adding in a little bit of distinctions for different kinds of phases of matter. So rigid bodies, deformable or non-rigids, and fluids could be modeled by slightly different hierarchical graph structures. But then the idea is that now this model um, is end-to-end -end differentiable, so it can support you know, relatively straightforward gradient-based optimization for control. So here's actually implementing a control policy on a real robot that's tasked with the goal of making, taking this sort of sushi rice-like thing and making it into a certain structure. And it uses a depth camera with point clouds to figure out the shape. And then it, it plans a small number of grip squeezes, which you saw there, um, in a model-based control way. And this is, again, just, I'd say, you know, scratching the surface, so to speak, of how these approaches might be applied. Um, I'll just, I'll point to one other resource here, which has been developed by Dan Yeamans, but also a, a number of others at MIT and the MIT IBM Watson AI lab, Jeremy Schwartz, um, uh, was the lead engineer on this 3D world project and Chuan Gan, who's a researcher at, MIT, or at IBM and MIT has helped to develop this. The 3D world is a high fidelity multimodal platform for interactive physical simulation, which has just been released. And it's a really great tool. We've used it for some of these things and we'll continue to use it for. It has really high quality near photorealistic graphics, really good physics of many different sorts. Like here are just a, a sample of some of the physical scenarios that we've created using 3D World. It has not only vision, but also very good um, uh, sound and abilities to interact with the world. Um, so, you know, I, 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 we look forward to using this environment more and we expect to release a sort of challenge data set for learning physics that again can support control in a wide range of different kinds of situations, not just the simple rigid bodies that we've talked about. Now, the last topic I wanna to talk about is perhaps the most classic best studied topic in, um, in the cognitive science world when it comes to basic common sense um, object manipulation using physics, which is tool use. And again, I've, I've shown some examples of this, but you know, especially thinking about tool use in crows or non-human primates, famous studies from Kohler and others, where you're basic, the key thing is you're using an object to, to get another object. That other object might be food. Right? You, you make a hook to find um, an insect inside a hole in a log or to push something out from a tube or you put a, uh, a box on top of another box to get a banana or you use one hook to get another hook which is bigger and only that with that bigger hook can you get the thing you need. Okay, so these are amazing feats of multi-step planning and you know, many people have wanted to understand well how do you achieve these? 
goals. And I think, you know, at this point, I would say we have one good guess, which is some kind of hierarchical task in motion planning. And here I'm pointing to what's become a classic paper from Leslie Cabling and Tomas Lozano Perez, two of my MIT colleagues who I'm very lucky to get to be able to work with. And again, I know this community knows this work quite well. It's coming up on its 10th anniversary. And, you know, for example, and it's a very much thriving, alive and well. Here's a, one of this year's ICRA papers from Kaylin Garrett working with them and Dieter on um, extending this idea with uncertainty and partial observability and deploying it on a real robot. It's just one of many really beautiful applications of this idea where you know, you're, you're doing planning at a symbolic level of goals and sub goals and then integrating that with continuous motion planning and increasingly now with uncertainty for things you don't know or for ways that, for example, the physics might not be robust. Um, now there's a, the particular version of TAMP or task and motion planning, which I think is most promising for humans and ultimately for human-like robotics, has got to have physics in a big way. Um, if you talk to Leslie and Tomas, they usually try to stay away from uh, physics <laughs> um, uh, but or, or wall that off from a lot of what they do. But um, I think when you look at how humans interact with objects and all the flexible ways we can do things, I think it's pretty clear that we can really that we, that we can deal with physics and forces and physical properties of objects in all sorts of compelling ways um, and, ver and, and very uh, sophisticated and flexible ways. And one way to see this is to play what I um, have called the ABC pickup game. So here's an example of um, playing this with one participant of convenience I found around my home uh, last night. And I don't have time to show you the whole video, but the way the game works, and I guess you probably can't hear the sound. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear the sound, but um, the way the game works is you choose three objects, A, B, and C, and then you don't know this when you start playing. She doesn't know this, but now you have to pick up A in one hand and B in the other hand, and then you have to use those as tools to pick up the third thing. Okay, so the third thing was chosen was that, um, uh, that, that thing, <laughs> it's like a lens cleaner or something. Okay, um, yeah, it's not trivial, but you can do it. And think for yourself about how you would use those tools to pick up many other objects in the scene. Okay, could you pick up the, um, the lid? Yeah, it turns out you could. Um, could you pick up, what else could you or couldn't you pick up? Could you pick up the glass? Mm, I don't know. Um, you could pick up the eyeglasses. Um, you could pick up the cable. Yeah, okay. Um, what about, for example, other objects like the pen and the lid? What can you pick up with that? Well, can you pick up the mug? Oh yeah, it turns out that's pretty easy. So, she, so I'm posing these challenges to her and she's solving them in real time. Um, can you, um, and, and imagining also whether she can do it or not. And when you, if you try this game out with somebody, you'll see that we're not only really good at flexibly picking things up, but we're also pretty good at estimating what we can do. Although we tend to underestimate our abilities, right? And then we try things out and we see, oh yeah, actually we can do it. Like for example, um, here, um, uh, yeah, she said, can you pick up the cup? I didn't think so, oh, but then it turns out she can. Um, or one last challenge, um, I said, okay, pick up the, um, as your tools, the pill bottle and the light bulb. Um, and now what can you pick up with those? Uh, nothing, she says. <laughs> oh, but maybe she has an idea. <laughs> and here it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great stroke of insight. Again, I didn't say pick that up. She just realized, oh yeah, I could pick that up, right? Um, or could you pick up the uh, soy sauce? She says no, but then tries it out. And yeah, sure enough, she's able to pick it up. Okay. So just again, an example of flexible tool use. And I think that the approach that we might need to solve this is a version of TAMP that has, that has real physics as part of the motion, part of the planning. So Mark, Mark Saint, your host here, um, has pioneered some approaches to this. We did some early work with him uh, together, Kel myself, Kelsey Allen, and Kevin Smith. But when I say we, I really mean Mark. We helped inspire it a little bit. We did some human experiments. We, we wrote a little of the paper, but this is 98% you know, Mark's work, um, showing how to extend the TAMP idea by using simple kinds of differentiable physics to estimate the modes of, um, or to, to model the modes of, of promotion planning, and to, and to thereby be able to get multi-step tool use, like using, an ob using a, a, a hook in various ways to get an object, hooking an object to a wall, um, using an object to uh, get another object, and so on. Um, Mark has recently extended this to, you know, have not just go from models of dynamics, but to actually have force in there. 
and to have to deal with uncertainty and to represent the fact that like by by pushing an object with two fingers, you have um, much less uncertainty in your in the outputs of your or the effects of your control than with one finger and being able to appropriately reason about that. So I think the, the, nobody solved the ABC pickup task, but these are building blocks of how we might solve it. In our lab, we've worked on simpler physical challenges. And this is the last thing I just want to point to, because this is an area less in robotics, but it's sort of at the interface of AI, machine learning, um, RL, computer vision, and robotics, which are ways that a number of groups, including ours, are coming up with what are basically tool use challenges that can study ways we might use our intuitive physics, model-based intuitive physics, to solve problems in the world that, you know, from a robotics point of view, are ridiculously underactuated. <laughs> but again, it's all in your head. If you can conceive of the plan, if you can simulate out the physics and reason through the physics, then you can make these things happen. So motivated by like how you might fi um, figure out that without a hammer, you can still pound in your tent stake by using certain objects as a tools, right? Um, we developed something called the virtual tools game, and you can check it out online. Um, a, a group at Facebook AI developed something called Fire in parallel with us. We were both influenced by some of the same physics games, I think, for touch, touch screen and phone devices. And I, I'd suggest checking out both of these. And together, we've collaborated on a NeurIPS workshop proposal to develop joint challenges such as these for physical reasoning. And you know, again, I don't have time to tell you about most of the details here. I'll just point you to their website. But the basic idea is we have is in these games, you solve problems by dropping objects into the scene. So you pick up an object and you drop it in order to achieve a goal, which is to get the red object into the green thing. So sometimes you do that by launching an object or here to get the red thing into the green goal, um, you have to do something else, right? You have to figure out that you need to block an object that would otherwise fall in and block the goal. Okay, so there's a range of different kinds of reasoning that happen in these scenes that includes like catapulting like this, where people have to figure out how to do that, or scenes like this one where what you have to figure out is that you need to support this table, put an object under it, but at the right angle, not that angle, but this angle, or interesting creative kinds of launching where to solve this level, you have to figure out that you need to use this funny shaped object as a hook in order to launch the object. Okay. All right, so we've built a very, we've studied this now rather extensively, how people solve these problems. Because, you know, what's interesting is that people solve them not perfectly the first time, but they solve them within just a few trials. Some within like one or two or three trials, others maybe five or 10, but rarely more than 10. And we built a model, which is a very simple model-based planner. It just does forward shooting, but, it, but the key is it has a simulator in the head. It starts off with a strong object-based prior, tries out a few things, if it finds one that work that it thinks will work or has a high chance of working, it's a probabilistic physics simulator, the same kind we had before. Then it tries it out in the world, and if it doesn't work, well, it does a little bit of reinforce update, basically, and a little bit of epsilon greedy exploration in the mental simulator, not in the world. I think people never do epsilon greedy in the world, but they might do it in their internal simulator. And, um, and it turns out that this model is enough to, or sufficient, to explain how people solve a number of these different levels. And here we're correlating the model with people in terms of accuracy and number of attempts, or here learning curves, basically just showing on the x-axis we have number of trials, along the y-axis we have cumulative probability of a, an agent, human or our model uh, solving a task. And again, we match the learning curves relatively well, including what are harder, what are easier levels, and they're all solved within just a few trials. The model is also able to capture something about the precise positions that people make, although not all of them. And we show that it does better than models that don't have simulation or don't use reinforced updating or various kinds of more sort of RL type approaches. Okay. Um, ongoing work, and again, I'm, I'm not going to really go into any detail on this. It's time to wrap up. But the one of the things that we know is basically, and what I'm trying to point to and I want to leave you with are thoughts for all of us to think about, about how Physics, intuitive physics, planning and problem solving, and this kind of rapid trial and error learning go together. So in this model, planning is just forward simulation. And there's no, there's learning within a level, but there's no learning across levels. You don't learn to learn or learn to solve these problems better. But we can show in experiments that people do learn. So they can learn of like the concept of catapulting or blocking or tipping something over, including quite interestingly, tipping over from above versus tipping over from below. Like to solve this level, you can tip it over 
from by placing something off center underneath the bowl as it falls, so it goes like that, or by tipping something so it goes like that. And people can learn these kinds of skills and transfer them in, in, in uh, compelling ways to very different kinds of tasks, all right? And we're working on how do we model what is the concept of a skill and how does that learning work? And how do we integrate all of that, which is even though these are skills, there's still no multi-step planning. How do we integrate that with like the TAMP multi and physics-based TAMP for multi-step hierarchical planning? So a lot more remains to be done, but I, but I hope I've shown you well, both some of the basic building blocks and what some of the challenges are that I think all of us can work on together. I'm not gonna, as I said, go into anything about really how these things are learned because really fundamentally, we. We just don't know, except the one thing we know is that in humans, a lot of it is not learned in your lifetime as an infant. It's learned or built over evolutionary time. And I think on the AI side, what that's closest to is like all the brilliant people and the brilliant culture of the computer industry, which has built these game physics engines. So people like Erwin Kumans or Emma Todorov or Russ Tedrick and all the game designers who built Unity and all the things up to that. That's our, that's our simulated evolution. It's a lot faster than real evolution. And I think that's why I would urge the community to take those really strong model-based approaches or Yang Ming Hu and Diff Tai Chi, take those approaches as again, approximations to what nature has built into our heads and think about how to use them for you know, learning within those systems and planning on top of them. So I'll just, I'll, um, oops, I'll, sorry. Um, where's my conclusion slide? Okay, hold on. I'm trying to get to my conclusion slide. Um, these are the slides I'm supposed to skip. Okay. Um, so um, what I've, what I've uh, ho hopefully conveyed is the challenge and the research program of trying to capture the core of human common sense, focusing on physics in engineering terms, how we can start to reverse engineer these systems, study them quantitatively in behavior, understand something about how they work in the brain, which really motivates the kind of approach to planning and problem solving, where it's the same part of the brain and probably the same evolutionary legacy that gave us the tools for doing all these things, judging what's gonna happen next and figuring out what we wanna do and how to achieve it. Okay. And I've shown you something about the new tools from probabilistic programs, uh, you know, game engine style simulators in the loop, ways of using those for inference and control and things which I didn't have time to talk about, but are really just in their infancy anyway, program synthesis methods for trying to learn these programs, both to understand how they're learned online in the lifetime of, a, of an agent, but also maybe in a sort of evolutionary program synthesis way too. So I, I've, I've tried to sketch where I, I hope we're going as a field and what are some of the tools that in addition to the machine learning toolkit of neural nets and graphical models, I think we need all of these tools to bring together the different good ideas we have on intelligence. And really, it's, and really to tackle the, the big problems of intelligence, which are right at the center of robotics and where robotics is right at the center of the field. You wanna build a, an agent that can move itself around in the world and move the world around to achieve its goals. I think that's where common sense starts. And I'm really excited to work together across our communities to solve these hard problems. Thanks. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, is my connection actually okay? I had some uh, problems with connections, but I think it should be fine now. Okay. Um, so can you hear me? Just to check. I'm not actually hearing anybody. <laughs> um, I think Mark is talking, but... Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh-oh. Mark. Oh. Are you talking? Just yes. Like, Can you hear me? No. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to turn off my Bluetooth and then it will probably work better. <laughs> okay. Can, uh, can you guys hear me? Um, oh, oh, I no, can hear I, you. I, I had the, I had the, I, I muted the sound. That's the problem. I muted the sound on my thing because uh, sound was annoying. And I thought it was my fault. Okay. Oh, it was my fault. Sorry. Okay. No, I can I hear you guys just fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That was a great talk. Thanks so much. Uh, we, we have some, really good questions. And I think it's actually gonna be really good to use another 15 minutes or so to discuss the questions. But I should tell the audience that we are actually already over time. And I would not like to prevent you from also going to the social, like virtual socialization. Um, you're free to do so, of course. Um, but I still think it would be great if we uh, use some time to actually go through the questions. Sure. So really good. Things. So let me start with a simple one that, um, well, I don't know, simple one, but uh, Sylvia Herbert actually said, how can intuitive physics be used to predict the behavior of other agents? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you mean, so um, I could have given a whole other talk on intuitive psychology. So in, in cognitive science, the way we, the way we, um, the way we think about predicting the behavior of agents is to recognize that it, it, it builds on intuitive physics because we're all embodied agents. We have to, we act subject to the constraints of the physical world, but we have something distinctive to agency that is not the same in physics. We exert forces on the world, but we cause those forces and we do so roughly in, in accord with principles of, we would say expected utility planning. So the models that we build in common sense intuitive psychology is it, it, it's I think it's very important that we don't model other agents as physical objects, but we add something to physics, which is the ability to actively control the world. And then we try to understand those controls as the results of plans of agents who are maximizing expected utilities. And we think of theory of mind as trying to understand the expected utilities of other agents. So it's kind of like inverse reinforcement learning, but it's more like inverse probabilistic planning because we think of having a very structured prior of goals and possible sub goals and costs and different kinds of utilities that agents might have rather than a, a more unstructured like inverse RL type approach. But what we've shown in, in a number of projects, you know, going back more than 10 years is that that toolkit is, is a really good way to capture even how young babies understand the actions of others, um, both adults and young babies. Um, so it's, it builds on intuitive physics um, because it's because physics basically sets the cost of actions, but we have to specify what kind of sources of positive utility or rewards we think people have, and then we and then we assume maximal expected utility planning as a you know it's sort of that plays that's the intuitive analog of the let's say of f equals ma, right? Um, and but but just as we can work backwards to figure out masses from things that are or aren't accelerating in various ways, as I showed you, we can work backwards to figure out the costs and rewards that agents seem to be. Um, attributing to goals and their action possibilities. Right. Great. And then there is actually, I think, a line of questions. Uh, I, I'm trying to pack, like, order them a bit into topics, which start talking about symbols. Yeah. Uh, and I'll uh, cite this one, the first one here uh, by Cole White. Um, how could these physics simulators be integrated with high level symbol symbolic reasoning? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, and it's one that that um, we're working on. <laughs> so, so I assume you pro you're probably thinking of symbolic reasoning in the context of like symbolic planners, right? So when I mentioned that Leslie Kebling doesn't like physics, um, what that means is she really likes symbolic planning and, you know, sort of the, the strip style tradition of symbolic planning operators, which it, which is partly what led to the whole hierarchical task and motion planning idea, the idea that hierarchies of symbolic representations of actions, their effects and preconditions, you know, has, has been and continues to be probably the best way we know to get a robot to do some complex multi-step action, like, you know, the kinds of things we would want in a kitchen or some of the kinds of tool use scenarios that, that Mark was talking about. So I think, you know, I, I think of Mark's work, um, conveniently enough here, as some of the best work that shows the power of integrating a, a, you know, physics in the uh, lower level part of the system with hierarchical, uh, in a hierarchical approach with, with symbols to capture the more abstract notion of goals and sub goals. But what remains open to all of us, I think, is learning those symbolic representations, right? Because this is where we think one of the key things that babies learn, um, babies are not very good planners, <laughs> right? Um, in the sense of long-term planners, right? So we think that babies, this is one of the key things that babies learn. They may not learn that, all that much about the underlying physics, but a lot of what they might learn are the symbolic um, operators for planning, as well as maybe symbolic kinds of event or relation concepts that might serve as the goals or preconditions. And those in turn are going to be related to the other maybe consummate symbolic activity that is, goes on in children's learning, which is language learning. So we're really interested in how language acquisition and sort of learning to plan uh, bootstrap each other. I, I think many people are, and I think we're going to see that increasingly over the next a uh, few years of the field. I, th I think I saw that Stephanie Tellex's group and others from Brown had, you know, a, a, Stephanie's been working on that kind of thing for a while. I think they had a really nice RSS paper on this as well. So, you know, again, I think this community is is poised to is go big in that direction. Yeah, I, and, and I agree. I think it's one of the of the big like questions, open questions of how to, you know, what kind of representations we want to have to re represent discrete categorical decisions versus continuous gradient based reasoning 
Yeah, yeah. and how you might start from one and get to the other. So George Conaderas, who also worked with Stephanie there, that's something that he's really been, um, you know, Right. There, there's a line of questions along that thing. So there, there is also one, um, it's a bit long, but I, I'm shortening it, uh, which essentially says that Temp, uh, and I think he assumes this is uh, Kamyar uh, Gassimipur, uh, assumes that Temp, uh, of course, uses typically uh, logical and discrete frameworks to describe decision space. But then he's asking, how, how could you tie a shoelace in that case? And I'm, yeah, yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm the last person to ask about tying a shoelace because apparently um, I'm one of the 10% of people who don't know how to tie their shoes <laughs> or who, who, tie, who learn to tie their shoes in some weird way such that it always comes undone. I learned this from Drew Bagnell, who many of you might know. Um, he, we found ourselves walking down the street in Pittsburgh once when I was visiting CMU and he, he observed that my shoes and his were both untied and he said, you know, we have something in common. And I didn't even know there was 10% of the people who learned the wrong way of shoe tying, but I guess that explains why my shoes always come undone. Anyway, I think that's, a, you know, shoe tying is not something that we, um, I think, learn symbolically. But think about, you know, getting dressed, where you learn like, okay, well, you know, first you put on your shirt and then you put on your coat. First you put on your pants and then you put on your belt. First you put on your socks and then you put on your shoes and so on, right? Um, so there's a, there are certainly some skills that don't lend themselves um, to that kind of symbolic description. But especially when you think about the things that humans do, um, that children, that babies don't do, but children learn to do, and that then are so central to, you know, what we do as adults, what our cultures build on and are built out of, that's where you really start to see the symbolic level coming in. And that's why I think it's no coincidence that it also really only becomes accessible to us once we've learned language. Yep. Um, I want to pick another question, which I found interesting because it starts talking uh, about other things. So this is by Slatan Hayanovich. Uh, he asks, regarding prediction, prediction of other agents, do you go beyond maximizing expected utility and employ principles from behavior, behavioral econo uh, economics and limited yeah. rationality? Right, that's a great question. Um, and I should say, but let me just finish one thing of answering the last question, which I just realized, which is, you know, the one thing I learned about how to tie my shoes is that if I really needed to stay tied, I have to do a double knot. So I tie it once and then I do, and then I tie the loops into a knot. Again, that's a symbolic thing. And I learned that to make up for the fact that I didn't learn the right shoe tying policy. <laughs> um, okay, but um, back to the question, yeah, which is, so if we're trying to understand other agents, do we, we know we've learned from behavioral economics that humans are not actually, you know, rational expected utility maximizers in all cases. So are we incorporating in our models on this sort of inverse agent understanding side, those insights? And I would say to a first approximation, no, <laughs> for good reason. One is that, you know, um, first of all, that in the settings where we've mostly been focused, which are the most basic kinds of action understanding, like the, that young babies or kids do, where the actions are not like buying a life insurance policy or investing in stocks or making economic decisions um, uh, or even gambling and bandit tasks, but the actions are like reaching for things or reaching around or over things, or, you know, should I reach for something? Should I get up um, and sh or should I reach for something or should I get up, walk around the other side of the table and then reach? Um, and those, the kinds of costs that go into um, analyzing action plans and understanding people's goals in this sort of immediate embodied setting. For that, first of all, people are very rational in their motor planning and very close to expected utility uh, maximizers. So it makes sense to do that. And, and often really when we move around in the world. But, um, in, but I would say, first of all, increasingly we are extending our models to things like moving lo like longer term plans or things where um, you, know, you have to model um, failures of planning. Um, so, where, you know, where you, you, you tried to make a plan, but you didn't, it, it was a faulty plan or you, in, an incomplete plan, right? Um, and we have a, uh, a paper on archive. The first author is Shen and it's with Vikash Mansinga and um, uh, Tom Silver and me um, and um, I think some other people, um, I think maybe Jordan Mann. I'm not, I don't remember all the authors of that paper, um, but Vikash Mansinga is the senior author, Shen is the first author. And I, um, it's, um, it's an example of using probabilistic programming to do, um, to basically model, not using behavioral economics ideas, but basically to, to have a, a approximate, boundedly optimal planning algorithm in the loop and to use that as part of, um, you know, taking into account people's failures of plans. But I would just note the last point there is that 
the precisely the fact that behavioral economics is counterintuitive to people. You know, we kind of intuitively, like maximizing expected utility sort of feels right to us. And when behavioral economists come and say, look how dumb people are, they don't do this, at least in some settings, right? The fact that that was counterintuitive, it went against the intuitions of, you know, more than a hundred years of economic theory is just a sign of what we're talking about, that, that, our under, that our basic intuition, that is what we're trying to understand first and foremost on the scientific side, really does seem to have ideas of like expected utility and maximization, at least approximate probabilistic uh, maximization, built in to our, you know, our, our, our native ways of understanding others' actions. Mm -hmm. One reason I, I really liked Slatan's question was it was raising that topic of utilities and rationality, yeah. while at the first part of your talk, you were actually also talking about this amazing features, babies, animals, of, of selecting new tasks. Yes. Yeah. And I, I just wonder, like, it, does this fit together? Like, how, what do you uh, think? Is this yeah, I, I think absolutely. Um, you know, uh, my colleague, my MIT colleague, Laura Schultz, who's a developmental psychologist, has written about this recently and is really interested. So she studies children's play and exploration. And we together with a former student of ours, Julian Har Edinger, who is now a professor at Yale, really Julian developed as part of his PhD thesis, something which he called the naive utility calculus, which is basically this idea, but now but that we think about actions and others' actions in terms of expected utility ideas, um, but in some very simplified ways, even in childhood, okay? So we developed some of that together, but then we came to realize that, you know, we really have to be thinking about goals, not just utilities. And the, the real problem is what makes a goal? What, how do you learn what counts as a goal? How do you figure out what goals you want to have? How do you come up with new goals? So Laura's written some really interesting things about that. She gave a talk, there's, she gave a recent online talk at, I think, the um, Bakes workshop, Bridging AI and Cognitive Science, B-A-I-C-S, which was an ICLR workshop. Um, that had was a, a great place where for a whole day cognitive scientists and AI people were coming together. I would say check out Laura Schultz's talk at the Bakes workshop if you want to see some state of the art thinking about that. But it's really just an open frontier. We're we're doing some work together to try to put these ideas in computational terms, see if we can understand you know how by trying to explore the space of goals. Um, you might come to learn what your real utilities are, <laughs> or what's worth investing utility, or where the real costs are. Um, on the on the engineering side, um, with Leslie Cabling and Tomas Lozano Perez, we're exploring similar kinds of ideas of kind of goal generation in a you know basically an AI agent setting for for learning to plan. Uh, Tom Silver and Rohan are are working on that, and um, we I think we have a paper that will be submitted very soon on that topic. So, so uh, three minutes. Um, let me like choose a concluding question, uh, which is a bit about the future. So there's one by Florian. Scorty, uh, and he's asking, what advances would you like or hope to see in the next five to 10 years in terms of intuitive physics, simulation, differential rendering? And there is another question about, you know, asking about uh, artificial general intelligence. So do, do you have anything? Um, I'll, 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 try to, I'll try to do both. <laughs> um, for the first one, you know, I think um, the, 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 the people who are working on differentiable rendering and physics are brilliant and amazing people. So at MIT, I mentioned Yan Ming, Fredo Durand, Jonathan Reagan Kelly, a new recent junior faculty member joining. Um, you know, they're working in, in the interface of graphics and programming languages and systems. And you know, together with the kind of things that Emo Todorov and Erwin Kumans are doing and many others in the community, um, you know, a lot is happening there. I, I don't, I'm not asking for anything. I just want them to keep doing it and more resources, basically. Um, I think that the challenge is, right, how do you take these basically forward causal models and use them effectively for perception and planning? So differentiability is only part of the story because, you know, that, that can work as long as you have, you know, I mean, again, Mark's worked on this, Emmo's worked on this. Um, there, are, there are fundamental discontinuities that show up when you're making complex plans over long times with objects. And um, that's one of the basic motivations for the TAMP approach. So I would say integrating these techniques with hierarchical, symbolic, and physics-based planning is going to be essential. But also, the analogous things comes up in computer vision. Differentiable rendering is great if you want to um, uh, just perceive a single surface, right? But if you want to understand a whole scene where you have objects, discrete things and their relation to each other, and you want to see 
the, the, the cup is supported on the table, but now it's not, then you're going to also need some discrete structure in there. And so again, integrating just, you know, a hierarchical scene representations that also mix the symbolic and the sub-symbolic level and getting inference to work there, that's something we need a lot more work on. Um, as far as general AI, I'm not sure what the question was asking, question was asking, but I'll say where my, if I were to bet on something for general AI, and to the extent that I'm doing any work on this and our, our group is working on this, I think a really big open area is something I just alluded to at the end and skipped over a bunch of slides, um, but I'm happy to point to this literature, which is the work on program synthesis. So if your knowledge is something like a simulation engine, right, or um, linguistic descriptions of tools or things that sit on top of that, fundamentally, we realize that knowledge can't just be a bunch of numbers, a bunch of weight matrices, but it has to be symbolic. That means, I think, and, and really for AGI, we're going to have to be learning symbolic knowledge. It could be learning the architectures of our neural networks or learning the structure of our simulators, the things that right now are really all done by hand by humans. So that means we're going to need more progress on algorithms that write algorithms or, you know, programs that synthesize programs. And there's a really exciting interface of fields between people who've come out of programming languages, that discipline, um, and have worked on program synthesis techniques for a while, not machine learning based ones, but now they've started to embrace machine learning techniques, including neural networks, but also hierarchical probabilistic models where you try to learn like um, libraries of code, which are like priors in a hierarchical Bayesian program induction sense. We've done some work on this. I would point to just the work of Kevin Ellis, who just got his PhD from MIT, working with me and Armando Solar Lazama. He's, he and many others, but I just, he's the person closest to me right now, who's got really interesting ideas at the interface of symbolic, neural, and probabilistic approaches to program synthesis. And I think that's going to be, um, you know, I, I think AGI in, in any sense that people really want to talk about is very far away. But if we want to say what is going to take us closer to really general forms of artificial intelligence, that's going to be part of it. Okay. Sorry, Thanks, I need to cut you short. Otherwise, okay, good. Thank you. Thanks so much. you need to go. And I want to thank you again yeah. for this super great talk and also okay. to the audience uh, posing really good questions. Thank you so much. Thanks and, so much. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to have the next talk. Okay. In another see, you, see you all Thanks, around. Josh. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.